Okay, there we go. So a warm welcome to James, James Giancotti, who is the co-founder of Odd Up. Uh, we've got a mixture of people chiming in. Uh, I've got a, I'll go this way. Beautiful background, designed and enhanced by James's creative team. There is actually a, further down, can you see here? There's a, I don't do this, this is really weird. It's like being a weather channel. There's a code. If you want to subscribe to James's services, which are really very good, um, use that code, okay? Um, he can tell us, a, you can maybe tell us a bit more about what you do, but I just want to say this is, a, I'm kind of, you know, the normal Web Wednesdays are done firstly on a Wednesday. Obviously today is not a Wednesday. Uh, and so everything is being uprooted. Uh, and normally we're doing it face to face. There's a lot of nice uh, kind of meeting and having drinks and getting to know people. Uh, so we can't really do that. I've tried it on Zoom, it's really hard. So I just thought we'd, we'd have a good chat and then we could have some questions at the end. I'm, I've got to do this. Here's my sponsorship, can you see it? Ta -da! You can't see it, it's disappearing. I'm working out of the hive, which is one of the co-working spaces in Shenhua, rather nice place, full of French people for some reason. Uh, Le I'm sorry. Le Yves, as it's known. Um, so let, let's get started. I, it was very interesting. I was, you know, trundling through Facebook as you do with my finger. And I saw James post about this, you know, the fact he had a new way to predict the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, I was, you know, there's so much stuff out there on the web. I know James, so I thought, ah, this has got to be true, right? Um, and I know his background from Odd Up, which will tell us a bit more about in a moment, but the idea that he's looked at data with startups, you know, because startups have got a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily true, or it's hard to define your industry. And then you move that into crypto and the cryptocurrency world, which is even more kind of gray, murky. And then now into COVID, which is, you know, as changing every day. So I thought it'd be really fascinating just to pull this together. Um, and you've got your, I mean, you've given out, there's, there's a link, I think, but there's a, there's a PDF that you've put out, which is, which is good reading. Have any of you guys read that PDF? It's pretty good reading. Have you, have you had a chance to download it? It's long. Yeah, it's, it's long and it's, it's, it's actually more meaningful than most white papers. You know, most white yeah. papers have like 15 pages of credits. <laughs> so it was good. What was your impression on reading it, Kathy? No, it was good. I have to admit, I only made it through probably the first five pages, but yeah, it, 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 it was great. And I, I just ran out of time, left me with yeah. a lot of questions. Well, you got the man, you got the man himself here. Yeah. So, so James, tell us, tell us, just give us a bit of a background of why you got into this. I mean, I was fascinated, you know, you're obviously a guy that likes to chart, choose difficult battles. The first one, ranking startups. Then you get bored of that, you start ranking crypto which is even more of a challenge. And now you've decided that's far too simple. I'm going to go and work out whether COVID is going to break out or not. So uh, tell us how that, that journey happened. It's quite unusual and fascinating. Well, I'll go straight into the product on hand and then we can sort of go through how I got to where I am right now. But in the past six months, this world's changed in such a drastic way. And in the past month, we particularly get, kept on getting contacted by government departments saying, have you ever thought about using the prediction engine of Otter into predicting COVID and COVID outbreaks? And we said, no, we haven't. But that's a really good idea. Maybe we'll work on that. Um, and so this is really where the COVID-19 outbreak, sort of the idea of actually we could probably do it because we have the technology to do it, but it's certainly not our forte. But then particularly over the last six, seven weeks, we've been seeing a lot of data, which really worries me as an entrepreneur and as a, as a founder of a startup and seeing, you know, you and I know we've been, you know, in this startup game for about 10 years here in Hong Kong and there's a lot of people suffering. And one of the things that sort of the COVID prediction tool came about was the personal need to start seeing things move again. Uh, anywhere in the world. The whole world's been shut down. There's companies going out of business. The F&B sector, the travel sector's dead. So we thought, well, why don't we do something good with what we're doing? You know, people aren't going to be investing in startups for a couple of months while there is a pandemic. Why don't we look at oh, when can they start investing? When can they start getting together? And this is where the sort of the basis of putting the COVID-19 prediction tool came about. But then as we started cranking out the numbers of what we already had and what's available, 
globally, we said, actually, there's something here. But not the data that you just see from, you know, what's on the news, what's on the World Health Organization, what's in, uh, I think, coronavirus track, and there's so many out there. We thought there has to be something more than this, because this just can't tell us a predictive model. So the mode for us was, okay, let's, let's see when the world gets back to normal. And I can go into the details of how it works, the methodology around it. But, you know, one of the personal reasons were, was, you know, you know, and this is completely self selfish reasons. You know, I'm, uh, I've been doing so well with, you know, Asia miles, uh, you know, points and, you know, enjoying my life of travel. That's all of a sudden just hit me like a ton of bricks and I'm not traveling and to travel is such a headache. So when can I get back to that normality? When can I get back to the normality of having a dinner with five of my friends? And this is, a frustrating point to me that now needs to be explored. So, you know, like a bear, I want to poke and find out what's really going on behind the surface. Yeah, I hope you've got as thick skin as a bear, mate. You've put yourself <laughs> into very sensitive water. So just, just to, you know, for those who don't know you that well, what, what gives you the chops to be able to, you know, analyze and, I mean, you know, there are many companies out there who do data analytics, who mm -hmm. do apply algorithms to, you know, data, whether it's natural language processing and trying to do chatbots and things like that. What, what gives you the chops that, you know, people should come to you and say, hey, hey, James, you know, you've done this for startups and crypto, why not do it for COVID? What, 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 what makes you so special? I, I, I never think that anyone's special. I just think we work hard to get there. And so, you, you sort of mentioned that we've been doing startup ratings, investor ratings, and ecosystem ratings for quite some, some time. Um, before that, I was an analyst at Goldman Sachs for four years of my life. So I've been in the research game for a good 12, 15 years. The part where I feel that we've got better, you know, better cred than anyone else, particularly in prediction, is what we do every day. We rate startups, we rate investors. But over the course of the life of Odd Up, we've gone into rating cryptocurrencies, rating ecosystems. You know, the, one of the questions we get all the time is, you know, what's the next biggest Silicon Valley hub of the world? And, and that's what we provide every day on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, what's the biggest industry? Is it blockchain? Is it AI? Is it green tech? That's what we do. So we've built all the infrastructure around predicting every type of, um, of, of, of a predictive model, as in giving it a score, giving it a future score. So why can't we do this with COVID? So we've actually built all those tools and been doing it for the past six to seven years. You know, this is just data. Let's see how we can add further to the data. So but your, your data, I mean, I guess when you're doing, when you're analyzing businesses and, uh, and crypto, I mean, crypto is a very open, uh, so there's data all over the place, marketplaces, you know, trading floors, whatever. Where do you turn to for the, for the data that you're pulling in to analyze, you know, the, the, the kind of pandemic stuff? I, I, mean, I pulled some stuff off your, off your white paper that you put out there. You've got various sources, but maybe you could explain those a bit because I'm not, I'm not a, a data head myself, but although I really appreciate analysis, but I often, you know, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about, data and how actually it's not as pure as people think it is. So that's a separate mm. part of it. But there's the idea of where do you, where do you get that, that data and how do you know it's a trusted source? So I'll use the example what we've done for every day and then move into COVID to sort of give you a bit of perception of how we sort of put this together. So, you know, with startup data, typically what happens with a startup is they get a funding announcement. That will be the valuation of a company. These are the founders. These are the clients. These are the investors. And that's what it is at that point in time. And so most of that data is just what you see from a media element. What we do is look at the further background data. So this is just the startups I'm looking at. We look at, okay, what's their social media presence like? What is their web traffic? How many downloads they have in the app store? Who's moved in, out, in and out of the company? We look at the data that's not talked about as opposed to the, the data that is talked about if there's any corporate filings and so forth to give a score. When we look at COVID-19, we're looking at just more than just the data that anyone can find on Google. We're looking at let's look at the hidden data the data that makes the world move 
where the money moves, where the travel travels moving, what's happening with GDP, what's happening with um, hospital beds, what's and this is all data that's provided from each country in a, in a very clear manner. Every single country in the world has got a health organization that reports the numbers. Now, the only way that data is incorrect is if the people that are providing this data, being the governments of the world, is incorrect. Now, make, make of that statement what you will, but we have to assume that that data is correct. Um, of course, there's been some data that we've even combed further from the, from the COVID-19, where we've looked at, a good example is, cases coming out of Miami and Florida and southern states of the US where uh, people were diagnosed as having COVID-19 deaths. But when you look back in the service, the, uh, the, um, the details, you'll see, oh, actually that person was claimed as a death, but actually died from a heart attack. Well, that person claimed from a death and died from a motor motorcycle accident. And so looking into the data further on of going, okay, where is this actual virus hurting and where is this virus is a cause of the of the you know of the death, um, and so we've been looking particularly at the data, particularly with COVID nineteen, where there is um, a term that you'll hear. Now I'll tell you a little trick that you guys will hear now every time you watch the news. Um, one of the things that people have been confused about when they look at the data is one being this person died from COVID or this person died from symptoms. Yeah. or complications of COVID. So what we then do that is track back of going, okay, look at the life cycle of the person, the life cycle of, of, the, of the individual and look at the big risk of prediction. Um, the uh, the good, good thing about now is we're at the point in time now the narrative is becoming more and clear that the prediction is most likely going to be correct. But the data for us is the key. So we're not just looking at what the government tells us. We're also looking at what the background data tells us, you know, hospitals. So let's just, let, let's just break that down a bit because there's, um, um, I know in your report you say that you're getting data from, where is it, the world in data, right? Is that, what, is the, what, what kind of point yeah, is all, that? Yeah, all world data is a combination of um, multiple sources. So they'll have the WHO, the WEF, yeah. the, you know, the Australian, the Hong Kong, CDC, all, all these governments will put it into one source and that will be where typically it comes from. And I think if you Google anywhere, you'll find, um, you know, coronavirus stats and most of that stuff will come from yeah. a generic source. But I, I heard a story, tell me if it's wrong, maybe it was a kind of, you know, rumour was that uh, good old uh, Trump in America, the CDC was collecting data and he wasn't too happy with it. So then he moved it away from them to a private organisation. Uh, which over which he has influence, and for some strange reason, those numbers started changing. So I guess the, 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 the source, uh, the collection, is an important one, right? And as you just pointed out, it's how you, in terms of disease and illness, because that's not just one source. You're saying is how it's qualified in a, in a hospital on a deathbed, you know, whether it's called, you know, kind of ER style. You know, is it called as COVID or is it called as you know, symptoms or whatever, because it seems to be really hard. But that, that bit, I mean, obviously is one source. You said you had other sources. You said you were looking at uh, flights. Mm -hmm. I mean, that must that must spend take you three seconds a day <laughs> on the other <laughs> flights. Right. There's one out of Hong Kong, there's two out of London, and there's one out of Paris, right? There's something going on. So you're looking at flights. So you take it from like kind of flight stats, like on the web, or you're actually plugging yeah. in to airports. Where are you getting this kind of data? Well, the beautiful source is everyone's got access to is flight aware. So if you've got a flight aware, um, I mean, most people do that if they're checking it when a friend, you know, these were the old days, goodness me, when I say stuff like that, but you know, when people yeah. used to land, used to find on flight aware how long it would take until they get to the airport. That's what I use multiple times. But um, uh, these are sources of flights. And the good thing that we started sort of asking the question is, it tracks every flight, every flight worldwide track. If it's cargo planes, if it's passenger jets, where flights are coming from. And the reason why we looked at this from a predictive perspective is, is ultimately find out where the virus would tra transmit from. Would it be coming from a, uh, you know, which countries would be basically leading to it? Um, for people in Hong Kong, you'd see a consistent flow about two, three weeks ago from India, from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it wasn't India and Pakistan. It was actually the airports in Qatar, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. So they're the ones actually feeding those, the, the, the virus through. 
Um, and also what we're also looking at when we look Wait, at- Wait, so you're saying it's not the source wasn't the country, because if it's a country carrier, you're saying you're, be, you're being misled because you're going this flight is a Pakistani Airlines, but it's not actually the country that's the source, it's the airport that's the source, is that what you're saying? The airport's a transmission. And the one okay. thing that we wanted to really nail down is this misperception that you catch the virus on the plane. There is no categorical evidence so far that we've found in millions of cases that you get a virus on a plane. No. I wish the I wish the Cathay Pacific guy was on this call. He did a he did a, a like a that we just had the start start me up festival, you know, here in Hong Kong. As yep. You know. yep. And I think uh, is his name Ed. He, you know, the CMO of Cathay Pacific was on some panel and he's like, let me just tell you, there hasn't been a case of COVID on a Cathay Pacific airplane. And you kind of listen to that and you go, really? So you, you've just reinforced that. Okay, interesting. So it's not, you're saying that the data shows it's not transmitted actually in the tube that's carrying you through the air. Yeah, so, so what we've been seeing over and over, particularly as more data is coming about, is that you know, shared households is one, but what are you sharing in the household? So what you've been seeing, I think New, New Zealand would be an interesting story now because after nearly three or four months of not having a virus case, there's four people in the house that have got a virus. Now you assume that these- Yeah, I think it's spread to 17 already. They've got up on 17 already. Well, so the question would be coming back to is what are they touching? Well, let's come yeah. back to the stats here. And the stats is a reason why we're pushing this together because things are starting to form a pattern. And one thing we've learned from startups and investors and ecosystem is when things form a pattern, it actually makes a best case for what you do, hence the prediction. So if we look globally, we see that a very clear amount of the majority of people who are dying are from nursing homes. The second amount of clear transmissions are from meat works and people who work in, you know, you know wherever they kill meat, chicken, all that sort of stuff. The third one is jails and prisons and places like that. But coming back to it is how many people actually die from this transmission. But in any category, there's none of one, and we come back to travel, that everyone's been getting it from a Cathay Pacific flight. They're not, and it's just false. Interesting. It comes back to those three, they take up 87% of all cases. The next one is homes from people's houses, where people have someone else who's been infected and then everyone else has been infected because they share things. They use the same toilet, they use the same shower, they use all sorts of different things. So once you start unpacking the data, the data it's very easy to form a predictive model. The difference is, do people actually want to hear it or not? And that's all right. So, wait, so wait, we've, got, we've, got, we've got the medical data, you're getting this yep. uh, kind of, you've got the uh, airline travel data. What else are you looking at? You have financial data, you're looking at um, are you looking at how much money governments are handing out to people or what, what's your, what, what financial figures are you looking at? So in the past, um, so the past three or four months, there's been an increasing amount of government um, uh, stimulus um, and handouts. So a couple of interesting things we've been finding out and we're trying to push into further details, but the California actually announced this, that anyone who in California who gets the virus will be paid $1,250. So you mean who gets the virus, who gets the virus? Who, or yeah, who, who dies gets the virus, not if they die, but who gets the virus. Okay. Okay. So in California, you've made that announcement. I think they're going to retract it pretty quickly hmm. because people who don't know Hong Kong well enough would know a story where um, there was a rat problem in Hong Kong and um, uh, when you took the rats back, the, the former British colony would pay you money. So what did the people in Hong Kong do? They started, uh, you know, reproducing rats, so they kept on getting more money. <laughs> and the same thing would be Importing, them, importing them from China in bags, I can imagine, yeah. in those stripy bags. Uh, and, and another thing is the data of the handouts. New, New York is interesting. So New York had a massive outbreak. Um, but one of the things that was very interesting that we looked at the financial data to hospitals. So hospitals for a certain few months, March to through to May, were getting incentivized for uh, people who were on a ventilator. So if, if the person who went to a ventilator, you would be getting 33,000 as opposed to someone who had a heart attack, which is between four and 6,000. So if someone was on a ventilator or had COVID, the government would give the hospital more money. Then Trump, of course, said, for, oh, I don't know about for, this. What, for what purpose? For, for Just because this. they wanted to stop, stop, the, uh, stop the, 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 the spread, as everyone would say. So these okay. are things that we look at the money going, okay, so if, that if the money stops in a certain area, will things change? 
There's also been stimulus packages. In the UK, there is a stimulus package until October where people are getting paid 70%. So we're looking at places where there's a financial incentive to actually induce numbers. And so when those financial incentives stop, we will see ultimately how that would be then leading to a reduction or, or reduction. One of the and that's about to happen. So you're saying your numbers are all about to go crazy in September, October, when a lot of these handouts start to dry up, right? They could really drastically stop. You never know. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the yeah. financials. What else are you yeah. looking at? So you've got medical, transport, uh, air flights, financials. Mm -hmm. what so, else are you looking so, at? And we're, we're also looking at uh, the rate of, and this is stuff that has been well known, the rate of um, uh, tests. The tests are very interesting because there's been a lot of hearsay about what those tests do and how how structured they are and who does the test, which country does the test, what access to the medicine they have, and on a per basis. So one of the things that you'll see on any given website that covers the stats is how many people tested per million, how many people died per million, and seeing how that tracks in. And that's one another thing that we're doing to predict the model moving forward. As in, if there's more people tested or you can manage the, the virus more, of course, there'll be higher rates of COVID-19 positives, but at the same time, You've got, you've got more of a, a herd immunity, which people talk about. More people that get the test, uh, they get the virus, the more likely it's sort of going to pass. And I thought, I mean, uh, you know, I've been trying to educate myself the whole way along. Sure. And, you know, more, much more intelligent, biogenetically aware people than me talk about this. Uh, is it called R? It's like ARPU, right? But it's not ARPU. The rate of, you know, one person transfers it to another three or whatever. There's, if you Correct. keep it below one, apparently you're in a healthy situation. So is that... Is that a measure you look at, or have you got a variant of that? You know, that, what is it? Is it AR? It's got a special yeah. name. So, the, so the rate of transmit. There's a pen of one, and if it's up, it's going to be increasing further. If it's down, yeah. it's better. I mean, effectively, that's a, a type of predictive model. That's a model that's been put through the, um, you know, it's a, a very simplistic model. I mean, yeah. people would say it's complicated, but it's effectively the more people you get, the higher it's going to increase. Everyone's thinking about this curve, you know. This, curve, this curve yeah. that we had to manage, um, you know, get the curve down, get the curve down. Um, and so uh, that is effectively how fast that curve goes up and curve goes down. That's a method we include, but we've built our own to talk about a one to 100 score. Um, the curve so let's talk, let's talk about, let's talk about, so I understand the sources. Were there any others? Any other There's major ones. We're looking at adding more and more. Um, particularly political move, movements, that's has been very interesting. Um, we've found that when, and this is probably the most contentious part of the report that we probably will get ourselves in, into trouble with, but as there's been more political moves in a certain country, more lockdowns have occurred. Um, interesting. And yeah, Gordon, Gordon might know some bodyguards. He's, he kind of likes to work out. So if you're looking for some well-muscled people to keep you protected, <laughs> reach out to Gordon. <laughs> But yeah, tell us about that. So the political, yeah, I mean, the political bit, obviously being in Hong Kong, yep. you know, there's many, many theories flying around. And unfortunately, a lot of this lends itself to conspiracy theories, you know, yeah. uh, of which there's probably some truth in all of them. But it'd be interesting to see the political side, especially given that, you know, the world's biggest pseudo-democracy is about to have a vote, right? So Yes. Uh, and if, uh, who knows if the vote works out the way it wants, maybe everyone will be cured tomorrow, who knows? <laughs> That's so interesting. So how, how do you put, what happen? <laughs> so how do you put a how do you put a number on the political? Are you, are you looking at like spend, or you're looking at are you looking at, are you analysing what they're saying? Are you, are you moving away from numbers and actually looking at kind of you know natural language processing and the terminology used by people and stuff like that as well? Yeah. So I think the one thing that was sort of curious, and this is where we travel paths came, uh, the travel uh, paths and travel restrictions came. Um, much more of a surprise was political moves versus health moves. Good example is Taiwan and Thailand, both apparently clear. Now, if I was just dumb as I may be saying, well, maybe Thailand and Taiwan can have flights between each other. But of course, Thailand just yesterday announced they've um, delaying flights and access to flights until potentially Chinese New Year. 
then of course today you hear that there's some social unrest with the royalty and the crown. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm looking at the data, but effectively the data is now starting to become, it's not about the virus anymore. There's some more elements to it. So when we look at a political spend, how many company countries are printing money how, and all these things coming to fact is ultimately how they're going to manage COVID-19 and where the predictability of what the rate of transmission and ultimately where they open up in the future. So there's the so things are, that we've been are, looking are parties, at. Are government parties turning to you? I mean, What's that given right? the, the fact that you've got a political uh, element to it, are political organisations and you know, lobbyists and stuff turning to you and saying, hey, wait, this is quite interesting. Can we, <laughs> can we, <laughs> can probably we, to, probably to get rid of us, maybe, maybe who knows? <laughs> no, 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 honestly, I mean, like to kind of use your data, you know, the problem is we live in a, people have been dabbling in but what's the most, well, where do I turn to for information, right? If, you know, from people with power to little, little folk like me. So how, how do you, do you find the real, you get any inquiries from these kind of yeah. political, you know, lobbyists and people who was trying to say that we need to really understand this, whether we'll use it for political reasons or commercial reasons, um, you know, it seems we're not going on there, right? We're actually not getting much from political, but more from committees and bodies. So what I mean by that, it could be the FNB organization of, of Hong Kong. It can be the people from the Travel Association of um, Singapore. People like that that needs to tell members because besides the, the politics and you know all these things that surround us and this sort of polarized world we're at living in, people still have jobs. And particularly the FNB and travel industry are probably going, you know, when the hell do I open up my restaurant? When the hell do I open yeah. up my resort again? So the people in those committees are much keen to get that information. Um, and get it fast. And one of the things we did with the tool is, you know, the free tool is it, it changes as it goes. It's live every day. It changes as that data comes through. So it's always on every day of the week, 360. That's the hardest days. part. I mean, that's the hardest part I find in the business world or it was, you know, schools or whatever, is just this, this kind of unpredictable cycle of open, close, open, close, open, close, right? It, and I, mm. that makes it very difficult to plan uh, you know, opening schools, opening businesses, going into retail, investing in, I mean, the whole investment community that you know well and I kind of tickle at, they must be just completely, you know, befuddled by it all. I mean, they're usually all quite resistant to invest, taking risks, but this must, are you seeing that affecting their decisions as well, whether they invest in, in companies? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of talk in the media of, you know, companies who are kind of COVID pivots, right, whether they're selling you know, masks or air conditioners or body measurers or something. Do you see a, a change in direction in the investment community too, in terms of what the effects are of this? Yeah, um, huge, huge changes. Uh, from a, a silicon, so I spent typically every normal year, I would spend six months in Hong Kong, six months in San Francisco and travel between. between so the summer San you're Francisco. in San Francisco, the winter you're in Hong Kong, is that how it works? Uh, pretty much, yeah. You know, it's yeah. all, the way it's all winter it. in San Francisco, really. <laughs> so um, well, it's nice and pleasant in San Francisco. Um, so what we found, particularly in San Francisco, is there is a massive movement to work from home. And so from, let's talk about, let's, before we talk about the F&P, the travel, people who do day to day jobs, we'll look at the corporate jobs as well. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot of businesses, particularly your WeWork type, mm. concern greatly what happens next. The second thing we're seeing is- um, Except they just got another investment from, from Masayoshi, didn't they? I read in the correct. news, another, he's like, here's yeah. another billion dollars. Yeah, right, sure. Thanks. Keep the lights on, oh, no. yes. Uh, keep it um, but I mean, more rea more re more realistically, it's uh, a lot of companies in the valley have opted two policies. The first policy is don't come into work until two thousand June two thousand and twenty one, um, for one reason that is uh, they don't really know how predictable the things are, and two they don't want to get sued because there's a, a a culture in the US to sue, and so if you were to go to work in the next three or four or five months, get sick, something would happen to you. The company would be then. Um, at risk. So that's one. The second thing, uh, of course, is the, the financial world. So the financial world, if you think about it, volatility drives finance. Like your banks of the world are loving it at the moment. They're making a killing on the movements up and down and everything like that. So that's the bit that really, really shocks me is I just don't yep. understand. I, I, I mean, I don't understand how that works. I mean, I was, I'm, I, my economics at A level or a O level was like, you know, it's a reflection of what's happening in the business, you know, the stock market is a reflection or whatever. It seems very skewed and very different. 
very hard I'll to get better at. I'll give you a one sentence reason why that's the case. And this is where we track money. It's part of the predictive model. That is to do with the multiple printers around the world printing money. So every country in the world is printing trillions of dollars. That would mean that any hard asset will be worth more money and cash should be worth less and less. So effectively the stock market will go up, gold will go up, silver will go up, cryptocurrency will go up, houses will potentially go up because they're hard assets versus cash, which will become harder. Hyperinflation will come in the years to follow, unfortunately, but that's the nature of printing lots of money. So let's go on to the actual, you know, do you want to pop something up and show something or should we just sure. talk about it? I know you've I mean, got, I might, I mean, you have a very nice graphic. I actually think the way that you take this data and you, you have five categories that you use. Do you want me to give you, um, can I, I give you sharing? Yeah, do you can, have sharing power now? Um, I can do that, hopefully. Um, let me just see if I can, let me share my screen, share. Share this. Okay. So can you guys okay. see that model? Yes. So this is the free version. I can. I can. Can we just confirm with us? Everybody can see it? Thumbs up. Yep. You great. Can see it. Same. Excellent. Okay. So this is a model. Just go to odup.com. COVID-19. It's free to use. Now, this we've got a much more complex model that I'm happy to send at the end of this, which we do reports to show virus, lockdown, curfew, and different measures. And, you know, Victoria and Mel Melbourne, Victoria has given us a plethora of data this month yeah. for sure for that. Um, but, you know, example is every, every major country, um, we're about to launch Hong Kong, how bad of us not to, but um, Hong Kong- It's not a country. country. Can I just correct you? It's not a country. Yeah. <laughs> oh, watch, it, watch, it, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at my former country, Australia. I mean, most of these data, they, they, the stats and data is available. Um, so all this stuff's available. Um, but the key thing is the score and the measure of increase versus decrease. Now, anything in the green would suggest things are looking good. Could you, could you zoom in, level. zoom in a little bit, just so we see it, the numbers um, of it? Um, I'm um, hoping to. Uh, let, me, uh, let me make this bigger. Yeah. Um, let me make this bigger. Is that better? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, better, thanks. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, da the data will show you, I mean, uh, this stuff is available, odup.com slash COVID-19. Um, anything in red would say that um, there is a concern that this won't open up as best as it should and there will be more, uh, the virus will still continue. Anything in the high 60s to 70s look like there's a predictive model over the next three months that it would get better. Anything is this out of 100? Is. This is out of 100, is it? Is out of 100. Yeah, no. 100 means 100. 100. Okay. 100, like New Zealand wasn't at 100. Still was wasn't at 100. There was always a risk for New Zealand because oh, okay. there were still flights coming in and out of the country. There was still food coming from New Zealand in and out, still uh, okay. cargo planes and so forth. Um, uh, but let's, I mean, I'm just going to look at Belgium here for an example and, load, and it loads up. You'll see that there's, you know, being one new case. And there's a fair bit of data that's available. The first being there's... The, Sorry, the one new case in what, what period of time? What, what are we looking at? So this would be today, on the oh, past okay, like okay. 24 hours. Okay, okay, so okay. everything is live. You'll see okay. the tests per 100. So that's like a 16% per 1K pound of people who are being tested. So about 16% being no new deaths. Um, but these are the key things, which are the basic scores. And what that would be is the growth rating would mean the growth, the po more positive the growth, the better the chance for uh, full open. Government control means pretty much as it says, the government's got it uh, um, under control. The trajectory is meaning that if this thing keeps on going, there should be no lockdowns. It should be relatively back to normal. Medical attributes meaning the higher the score, the more concerned. This is a relatively low score. Coverage pretty much, it's a universal healthcare. Now I'll move this screen out of the way so you can see it. Um, and then you can see this is a pretty centered flat line up and down. It's actually heading down now. Um, this bottom line just shows how many cases there have been. Um, but the, the line that you should be looking at, of course, is the, uh, the flat line. Um, if I compare it to, let's look sorry, at Sorry, Sorry, your, your, your orange line just now was what? The little, little orange dot. Oh, let me go there. back to that. Sorry, I just, yeah. I just pulled out of it. Um, the orange line would show you um, sort of, uh, the orange line is our score line how we're seeing this, uh, you know, how is it, how is it scoring accordingly? Um, sorry, so that's the score line. This is actually the new cases line. Um, okay, gotcha. And how that, okay. how that affects the predictive model. Okay. So let me have some water there. Um, now, if I look at a, um, I wouldn't say a worse off country, maybe a country that hasn't performed as well. Let's look at Bolivia, for instance. 
um, you know, you can see that, you know, there's been, you know, at the moment, not many tests per 100,000 people, there's been 15 tests per 10,000 people. So really <laughs> one point, not even 1.5, 0 0.15. Um, the score is the growth is actually negative, which means that it's increasing at a rapid pace. There's been 1,700 new cases in the past day, 66 new deaths. Even though the government is trying to get on control, the others are looking much more poor. The medicals would say that um, in this instance that there would be uh, a lower life expectancy and you've seen it, that you know it's a 71.51, which is another thing that we looked at. So we looked at the average life expectancy from each country. Um, we have seen a consistent uh, view that it's aged care that keep on dying from this. So like this is life, expect language. life expectancy before COVID. You've just taken that before as COVID. Yeah, like as in average people in in Bolivia, what would they average okay. age of death? Yeah. death. Okay. Um, and to see if this matches. And of course, if this is um, higher than the average age of the people dying of COVID, there's a concern. If it's if the average age of COVID was 90 and this is 71, well, reality speaking, COVID is 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 probably the, is actually in a better stage. I mean, it's terrible to use those numbers and those methodologies to talk about people's lives, but it's it's more the case of looking at the data and reality. Now, if, when we also put this data together, and I'll come back um, to sort of the main picture, is that we also looked at the types of things that kill people um, in each country. So it could be heart disease, it could be um, traffic accidents, it could be cancer, it could be, you know, Typically on most countries, COVID sits between 15 and 20 on the ways that people die from it. So that's what an mean, awesome what interesting... What do you mean between 15 and 20? 15... So there are more people who die from diabetes, more people who die from oh, cancer, see, more okay. people who die from all these other things. And if you're looking at the ways people can die, um, you know, COVID sits between, on average, for most countries, between 15, 15 and 20. Oh, you mean it as, a, as, a, as just a list, not, not a percentage, just a list? Yeah, like list. suicides okay. way up there, all these okay. other things that yeah. kill more people. Um, uh, heart disease, usually number one, yeah. uh, or number two, cancer, number, number three. Um, the other thing I'll show you is this, this report. Um, I think Kathy mentioned it's quite a lot to take in. The one thing that I would sort of, and we can sort of talk about this, um, is the methodologies we used and ultimately then, you know, what our recommendations and what our observations are. And if yeah, the recommendations, can... observations are very interesting, the observations, because that's kind of obviously your value, right? People don't understand what the hell yeah. do I do about this? So to put it um, as blunt as we could, we had a much more complex document, which yeah. was, cut down for many reasons, and I won't go into any other reason besides it was edited by other people, um, uh, but there was more recommendations, more observations, which we thought we couldn't include, more sort of bombs there that probably didn't really need to be there. Um, but if I move to- You mean recommending the removal of states of heads of state? <laughs> I'm not saying a word. <laughs> this is recording. Okay, okay, I'm shutting okay. up. Yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. I'm not asking I, you. I to. love my country, wherever it may be, wherever <laughs> I am. Um, so <laughs> let's just, let's maybe before I talk about the recommendations, I'll talk about some things that we've seen and sort of give you guys some freebies of what we're seeing when the next outbreaks will occur. Um, I'll go back to my former country being Australia. Uh, we see a lockdown curfew potentially happening in Sydney in the next two or three weeks. Uh, on, that would be an interesting on, based thing. On, based on, on all right, of your numbers. Maybe. What's that? Based on all the numbers that you're, you've shown from your... Yes. Okay. Yes. And all the other tools that we're predicting, uh, such as uh, growth, transmission, flight paths, all these things as well. Um, it could either be Tasmania or the New, New South Wales. And, um, we hope it doesn't. We really, really hope it doesn't, but that's a possibility. So people like Adrian who are on this call and are Australian should just stay in Hong Kong for the moment. Right? I, I, would, I, would, I would advise Adrian and every Aussie to stay in Hong Kong until yeah, okay. Hong Kong kicks us out. So that's my advice to, okay, nice <laughs> my advice to all Aussies out there. Okay, um, Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't want to look at too many pictures, but if you could just choose sure. a few, that'd be good to illustrate the, the point of this. Would be yeah, great. So maybe um, I'll just maybe I'll just show you guys this one, and this is probably maybe I'll try and make it, make it bigger. Is yeah. this is it's on the report, but these are things to look at. The first being where we see the prediction, where we see um, the virus continue on to grow. South America, Africa, and Middle East are really the three main uh, places to look out for. 
Um, the key places about that is that we're seeing a cluster continuously build and not, not enough um, medical support in the um, the western side of uh, South America, so everywhere from Brazil through to Argentina, this will be a continuous source. Um, governments aren't as wealthy as uh, other western countries in the world, so there may be a continuous flow. Of course, Brazil and Argentina will probably just deal with it as they deal with it. Um, what we are seeing though, is, and this is hopefully helpful for the people in Hong Kong, is that we actually recommend a travel bubble within the APEC region. Um, we don't see a, a major discrepancy of why that shouldn't be. Um, uh, places like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, the risk was, um, well, the original conversation that was had, had between you, I, and everyone in the world was, we needed to get the curve down. That's moved to, we need to completely obliterate, obliterate the virus. So if we go back to the first narrative of getting that curve down, every one of the Asian countries, including Australia, mind you, have got that curve down mm. to a, a reasonable level, particularly with the, the rate. So you, are you predicting that the, uh, in the same way you're predicting that there's gonna be another outbreak in Australia, are you saying that there's enough numbers there to show that these kind of the bubble, the travel bubble or corridors or whatever will be something that are possible to do before the end of the year? I would say without any question on our data that there should be no reason why there is a bubble within Asia. There should be no reason. Okay. The thing that so we can't say to is be... what politically happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so technically, um, I think the most curious and questionable question, question is, is Singapore and Hong Kong, who are yeah. known hubs that are both shut yeah. down. That is a bit of a shock. Um, but, you know, call me the cynic, but as soon as China is allowed to go into other countries, I see that sort of happening pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how that, we'll see how fast that happens after that. Um, uh, and then we've got, uh, we've got recommendations and predictions. on. Okay, maybe, maybe you could close, you close your, your presentation. We can just talk about, I, I am curious to know a little bit more about. So, um, yeah, we can take some questions in a moment, but just in terms of, so you, you gather all this data, what, what are you... Has anything really shocked you? Because I mean, if you weren't looking at it, you know, you'd be like, it's the world is full of rumors, right? One day I wake up and I hear a podcast or I listen to this or something, you know, I read the Apple Daily and I go, oh my God. And it is full of, I just don't know what to believe. So have you seen anything shocking that you weren't expecting or you're now going, okay, I'm taking my money out of here and I'm putting it here or telling my family to leave that country now or is there anything, uh, you know, Coming out of it? Um, oh, wow, that's like opening up a big, 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 big headache. I could talk for hours. Um, the data has really, I won't go into specifics, the data has upset me personally as a person. I oh, really? Yeah, it's really upset me because I'm sorry there's a lot that. of truths out there that are not being told. Um, because um, I think what's what's been more interesting is that um, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs by trade, tra so we always try and break things, try and har you know, harass how that works and really get down to the data, really get down to what's going on. But there is a, I think one thing that surprised me is the social obedience that has happened right around the world um, in to suggest what, mm. uh, you know, what the data is saying. And the reason why this is sort of confusing and con concerning me is that the CDC, the you know, World Health Organization, have said multiple different things that have changed. It's sort of like, you, it changes everywhere. You should wear masks, don't wear masks. You get it from cats, you get it from dogs, you get it from pigs, you get it from slaughter. All these things, they change all the time. So there's a fair bit of mis misaligned truths where people start to learn more about it. But as we're getting longer and longer, we see a consistent pattern. The thing that's more obvious is, and I think that's more concerning, is that there is a clear, um, need to protect the elderly, particularly nursing homes. Mm. I, I very clean need. That's if there was anywhere I would put my resources on, it would be there. But it's sort of, and you know, let the world continue on. Um, but there has been a, a, a narrative to keep the world um, sort of stuck for uh, in nursing homes. And another bit of the data that has shocked me the most, it just absolutely shocked me the most, is that. I didn't realize this, but the average lifespan of a person who goes to a nursing home is typically nine months. You mean so, from the moment they arrive at the nursing home, they've got nine? This is across the world. Nine months. 
across the world, on average. Oh. On average. I mean, it can be different in different countries, yeah. but on average. And so it, COVID is just, in, in as a virus, what we're seeing from the data is, is sort of speeding that, that, that nine months up. That's effectively mm -hmm. what, it, what it's doing. So it's no debate, no debate that it's not a bad virus. It's effectively like the best way to sum it, and this is sort of comes back to the data, it's a bit like having a, you know, when people, people go for, have cancer treatment, they go through, um, you know, virus, uh, various scans and, you know, it usually gets your immune system down. COVID is really much looking like that, that, you know, it's killing your immune system, which ultimately mm. will make you fail, uh, you know, your body will fail in. So that's really effectively the virus, but it's effect, it, 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 there should be more resources tackling where the problem is existing rather than the general po population, which 99.92% survive relatively easily. But it's interesting you're saying that because I think this, from what I'm reading, that seems to be one of the kind of truths coming out of the whole of this is that it's really sh you know, shedding light on medical systems and what works, what citizens work, what don't, you know, whether it should be private, that whole argument that they've had in the States for far too long, you know, mm -hmm. about whether it should be private or public or all this kind of stuff. So very, very interesting. Um, and where do you see this, you know, from you as a business? Are you doing this just as a kind of give back to society or is this, uh, are you being a ruthless businessman and you're planning to make lots of money? <laughs> I, I want I'm to know doing, where I'm you doing. see this because, you know, you, you've got your analytical business, right, with startups, with investors, with uh, crypto. And it's funnily enough, as you said, crypto seems to be getting, you know, there's a battle between gold and crypto at the moment. So we what I'd like to see is what do you think, given your background, I'm actually, but the second question, first question is, is you're going to be a ruthless man and make money out of this. Second question is, where do you see all, you know, what, all of the, taking all these little pockets of information you have from, you know, innovative enterprises to crypto and COVID, where do you see all of that kind of going? Is there some overlap between these things? Well, what the, what we put this product together because you know we want the world to get back to normal as fast as possible mm -hmm. and if people have you know as you cheers said earlier, to that mate cheers to that i've only got a cup of tea so salute. i wish yeah so i wish i had there. something else yeah. Yeah. Cheers to I, I i hate hearing the words the new normal i just want the normal i think that's really yeah. what i'm I, i'm sort of struggling with you know the normal was okay had its flaws but it was still okay um, so from a the ruthless business, no, actually, far from it. We actually, I mean, that's hence why the bulk of the information is free. You can get that access to it. If people want a full detailed report on their system, I, it could be a travel association, we can look in that, give that data out. But we did this for free because we really genuinely believe the world needs to know, you know, they can plan their lives. I mean, I'm looking for, I'm looking at a lot of my friends who are homeschooling their kids, wanting to, you know, literally, you know, they're, they're dealing it very tough. So it's, it's sort of not helping people out. You know, it's not helping people with work. It's not helping. And this is the reason why we're doing it. From a way it how it integrates within the business, we've managed to look at more public data and effectively the lessons we've learned from COVID-19, we can use it more for crypto because crypto is also a, a wealth of public data available. You know, the mm -hmm. blockchain is effectively out there. So, you know, this is where you know, we will look at, you know, how can we use even more, uh, more sources of data to define a predictive model? So this has actually been a wonderful exercise for us to improve our machine learning, our, our algorithms around prediction. Actually, from, that's very interesting. From a predictive perspective, are you able to predict, because now the whole kind of energy, especially in the political circles, seems to be moving towards who's going to come up with the vaccine, although I think Putin's cracked. Right? <laughs> So um, is, are you able to look at any of that data and say, well, actually, are you pulling that into it as well? Or are you just focusing purely on the outbreaks and when they're going to happen? Do you have any ability or is that kind of too, too much of a, a, a scunt to what you're doing to really be able to predict where that's going to come from? So we are looking at updating um, the model with when a vaccine comes. So a good example is, and we're doing some tests in the background being, who produces the vaccine, if it's Russia, if it's China, if it's India, if it's the US, if it's the UK, and how would you trust that and who would trust it and how would they implement it? Um, from the model that we've seen so far, and we don't know, we, we still need, we, we don't know who's going to produce it now. Mm -hmm. But what we can, can assess is that the rates will go down and we see the vaccine being uh, a solution for particularly um, the vulnerable. I, the people who are already sick or people who are, would most likely get sick in order to make things back to normal. But 
the you know that stuff is very hard because everyone says they're going through it i don't believe they're going to get it done soon and if they do how many people would actually willing to try the first vaccine out there um yeah. i would suggest not it's many. a bit like during sars in hong kong we had some i think we had a, a vaccine that came out but there were some side effects that were very very damaging they had all kinds of things going on that, that really did a hell of a lot of damage to people's livers and yeah uh, it, you know they, they rushed to market really quickly and Hopefully they've learned their lesson in Hong Kong at least. Anyway, so um, I want to open the floor to questions. So maybe the way we can do this is uh, rather than you all rushing and saying, maybe you can wave, put your hand up, unmute. I've got you here. So if you unmute, I can see you. Uh, Gordon's got one. Jump in, mate. Unmute yourself before you ask the question. All right. So I thank you very much for the data. Uh, one thing I, I think is is interesting is that you're grouping the United States which is very separate regions as one as one unit rather than breaking each of the states up because that's across the US we've had spurts in uh, New York uh, Texas Florida California etc and each state is effectively one of the EU countries Mm -hmm. So don't you think your U.S. model would be much more accurate if you were to break it up by states? Uh, before he answers, before he answers, can I just find out which state you're from, just so we make sure he doesn't tread on you? <laughs> uh, you can one? tell from the way I talk. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't, I, I, huh? Where are you from? Cowboy states, Texas. Texas. You are. Texas. All right. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I just needed to get that straight. Uh, the, good, the good news, Gordon, is we're going to release that late next week. Um, we have actually taken that approach. When we first did it, it was country. We're going to state. And the reason why we had that is, A, the US and to Australia were clear examples where, um, I'll use the Australian example, where you've got places like the Northern Territory that hasn't had a case in five, six months. Actually, no one has actually really got it versus Melbourne that's under complete curfew. So it doesn't make sense to group an entire, a whole, entire country like one state. The second thing is what we've seen in the data from uh, the US is exactly right. The model works very differently depending also what political preference they are. Um, we found it actually quite interesting to see uh, California um, data really, really tough um, and, you know, the East, some of the Eastern Democratic states versus some of the red states which, which haven't been as, which their lockdown laws haven't been as bad. But we go back to the numbers from the um, you know, how many people have died, how many people have been tested, and so forth. So to answer your short question, uh, Gordon, yes, that comes in next next um, next week. Every state will be predicted on their own merit um, because every state is providing the data. Um, but right. then we put everyone together in the US because we were doing a country by model, then we're doing a state model. All right. I, I just think it might be cool to actually combine them because it actually is the same thing, right? It's whether or not you put Hong Kong into China or keep Hong Kong separately, right? Uh, now, on to another thing. You said you're talking about the uh, 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 how likely you are to die from this, or, mm -hmm. or etc. Have you been skydiving? Mm, I haven't, and I'd probably die from that because of my girth. Oh, wait, wait, stop. <laughs> <a second. laughs> you, might just, you might just land and bounce wait, like wait. a good cartoon. Yeah. You never know, right? <laughs> wait a second. See, that's what I'm talking about. Skydiving is the safest sport out there. One out of 500,000 people die. Mm -hmm. so, the short, so the short answer is, if I lose weight, no. If I don't, I, I, maybe. Wait, 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 okay, wait, wait, wait. Can, can we just go back? Can we just go get, uh, that's a good question, but it's slightly off topic. I don't mind that, but you know what I think would be really fascinating? You're talking about the States is, uh, you said there's a certain political element to that, right? I've been listening to this Economist podcast, which, uh, which is really fascinating. I'm not usually into politics, but they have this thing called checks and balance or check and balance, talking about the upcoming US elections. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting to learn about state by state. Because, you know, when you come from a tiny little country like England, Great Britain, you know, you, you go, what the hell is that? So, um, <laughs> but it's been fascinating to, uh, I'd be very curious to see if you're, numbers if you do it state by state and you're because you're looking at the financial element and you're looking at the economic element i wonder whether that would be able to parlay across into the results of the 
elections if they go ahead. But you know, many be, people in the past uh, four or five years in the US have said that they'll predict the, predict the elections in the US and have turned out to be very, very wrong. So yeah. I think the election announcement will come out on the 6th of November or maybe the 5th night and we'll know that day. So um, I think also the US data has been changing quite rapidly. Yeah. Um, I think cancel culture has really, really hurt predictive data for people if they want to vote for Trump or not. A lot of people are now are shutting up and saying, I'll just make my case heard on the 5th of November. And that would be where it's interesting. So, I mean, it, it, the world has become very disjointed this year. And I hope by next year, we get back to a, a, a more honest and trustworthy method of And, and talking things. about the transparency of data, how, how are you getting, sorry, Jens, yeah, one question, I'll come to you. You just got me thinking. Um, China, how are you, you know, people always like to say, oh, you know, data out of China, where, you know, it's like a cup of tea, right? Mm -hmm. Or a cup of coffee, it's a bit murky. So how, how are you, are you finding that's true or not true? I mean, China, up to, in some cases, is very, very open about numbers that they share and, and stuff like that. So are you finding the numbers you're, because you're looking at available data, right? And I don't mean this in a political sense. I just mean this yeah. in a access to data, you know, uh, related to, you know, obviously flights is not something that's a challenge for you to get, right? Uh, some of the other categories you've got, medical, uh, money that's been handed out, that kind of stuff. Are you seeing any, any difference there? Um, we're looking at interesting data from China. So I have to, I'm in Hong Kong at the moment and there is a new law, so I'm gonna say nothing but kind words about our friends across the border. Um, but I will say that the data, what we're also looking at with the China scenario, because there's been, and this is something we're, we're tackling further, is EPA data, the environmental data. So anyone who's okay. been in Hong Kong in the past, anyone who's been in Hong Kong in the past uh, three, four months will notice that it's been clear. Yeah, we can see the, the skies again. It's beautiful. fantastic. And you can it's see the been... skies, but you can't go out. You can't go swimming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't go to the beach. I'm sounding like a spoiled brat, which I am. No, you're sounding just... like everyone in Hong Kong. Don't worry. I know, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, but it's just... <sighs> So we, we've found that data in China, I mean, we have to assume that it's correct. Um, and that data so far would be predicting the model. There's also an element of the data in China where there's so many provinces, so many places, and also the fear um, of people and their fellow men. And this is happening not just in China, but around the world going, I feel ill, I'm just going to stay home because the last thing I want to do is, you know, curfew the entire village or my yeah. entire town. You know, people don't want to do it. They're just going to, I'm going to stay home and shut up. Um, and so one thing that I'd like to see, and I think this will be more um, globally after this pandemic finishes, is the temperature checking, how that gets tracked mm -hmm. and all these things like that. My guess it will be software re related. They will be able to, you know, use your phone, ding, ding, it takes your temperature and all that. That's the stuff how they'll... Uh, uh, that's how it changed. So coming back to China, we assume that the data is correct, but you know the data financially is suggesting that um, uh, the numbers to help spread the virus have been dispersed, particularly because factories haven't been outputting as much data, so people are actually staying back in the previous villages as opposed to hubs like Guangzhou and Shenzhen and Shanghai and Beijing. So that's been an interesting thing. That's a thing that will come and affect the world in the years to come about uh, industrial output. Nice. Yen, yeah, sorry to, to stop you there, but go ahead. Uh, no worries. Uh, well, it's very interesting, James. Um, we, we talked about sort of the prediction. And I mean, if you do prediction in regards to elections or predictions in regards to COVID, how, um, and you often have people sort of saying, well, we predicted in, you know, October, the result then for January that you find out in January or the ones, how, how do you, how, is there a way or to put it, do you show, I mean, not just order, but basically when you make a prediction, then we will know in a week or a month or two, three months, if that was true or not. Is there anyone who kind of shows the, kind of takes that snapshot of those predictions then to be able for us to see, well, this, 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 this uh, company or this uh, system is very predictable because they are often you know, if, if we look back to what the prediction was four weeks ago, then they are often correct. Other ones are not. So, um, 
yeah how how do you and, and is in in your data is the way to also to look at that saying like you do this time machine go back and look at what did Odap say a month ago about Denmark and you know what is it now in Denmark you know so, I think that's so a very nice Swedish way to say are you doing due diligence on yourself correct we have to do that from our normal method of startups because for years we've been saying we predict a success and people are like, how can you predict it? Well, every single day we have a database dump and you see the level of where we see it. We've got it wrong sometimes, most of the time we've got it right and people go, okay, they said this. Publicly, we also go out and say these things publicly. So, you know, we, we hold ourselves accountable. I mean, predictions are like, you know, like opinions, everyone's got them, but you know, our business is all about you know, we say something, we better back it up. Otherwise, we're dead as a business. No one's going to use us anymore. Um, so from, uh, uh, from, you know, from COVID's pages, we're actually implementing the same features we do for startups, investors, ecosystem. We're actually adding that on. The, the COVID-19 page took us about three weeks to put together. So we're still, you know, adding more to it, hence the states that uh, uh, Gordon asked for and, um, you know, the, the transparency of this. We're also not adding too much features to it because... We hope that it's actually null and void in a couple of months and no one needs to check this in 2021 that, you know, when am I going to be able to travel again? So it's also, we're also not wanting to spend a lot of money on something that we want to finish very fast. Interesting. I, I am also wondering, is, uh, it makes me think Jens is uh, based in, he's actually calling from Sweden at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you know, it's interesting is that you've seen there, the kind of the, a lot of the Northern European, uh, it was that kind of herd immunization approach was, was an approach that was used to great failure in England, but uh, seems to have worked in, in non Europeans. Are you seeing, are you able to see, you know, which methodologies have worked, which haven't? I mean, that'd be quite interesting because talking to Jens's point about going back and seeing predicting you know, I guess people would look at your data if they're in government or, I don't know, and anybody who wants to say, well, this is where it's going to go, this is the action we should take. Have you, have you looked back at all? Have you been able to with your data? I don't know if you have that, that history to go back Sweden and say, is, well, actually. Sweden is the best case because the world it? have been looking at Sweden to say, well, Sweden basically didn't close its doors. There was a peak, but then it's sort of gone into herd immunity. But I look at the politics of Sweden. Sweden is a very socialist, democratic country. People are very much in, in, um, invigorated to take ownership and, and of the decisions. And you know they were cautious. You know there was a bit of you know while everyone was trying to figure out what the hell was going on with the virus, they you know they learned lessons like everyone else. But overall, their tool, their their method was probably the best in the world. From a in economic, a health perspective. Now, people. So, from all of your five, from all of your five categories, they're ranked pretty high in those general the, medicine, all the, all the various things that you have. Where is it? Medical attributes, thing, The one thing, and I'm looking at Hong Kong being the best oxymoron that could exist. So, you've seen cases in Hong Kong come through. Let's use Sweden versus Hong Kong. Now, no one changed their patterns of traveling on the MTR. No one changed their patterns of going to a, um, a restaurant. No one has changed major patterns. They've just changed certain things you can and can't do. Um, but the virus seems to go up when there's curfews and, and lockdowns, but seems to go down when there's none, which would suggest the opposite of what actually should happen. It should collapse and yeah. then go up. And so this is where the data is not making sense, whereas Sweden just sort of just did this and sort of done that. Which is what most countries in the world have yeah, done. Yeah, but then, but then, the but political then, problem. Uh, there, there's an element to that that I think you're conveniently missing out. Is the is the density? But well, I've been yes. to Sweden, and coming from Hong Kong, you, you feel lonely walking down the streets of Stockholm. You're like, where is everybody? You know, why aren't I bumping into anybody? Where where where, where the hell are people? So the de your your point, I think, is very valid. Is as soon as there's lockdown you're in a dense urban, you know, residential area, there's 40,000 people all at home, all going to the supermarkets, same supermarkets at the same time, all going to the same chatanting, all going out and walking around with their masks around the same tiny little park is, is obviously gonna lend itself to spreading a lot faster than having them wandering around town, I don't know, I'm guessing. Whereas yeah. in Sweden, you know, 
Jens can probably go for a walk and meet, you know, one duck and his granddad. I mean, right? <laughs> well, yes and no. Look at New Zealand, look at Australia. Um, you know, New Zealand's a very open country. South Africa is a very open country, but their numbers are big. Yeah, this is all about healthcare. All right, so you destroyed my theory. Thank you. That's fine. I, I'm not. I'm not I'm the not USA, one. California. Right. You know, Let's take any more questions. Are huge, but you know, like I, there's no one on the streets in San Francisco. So I'm asking, do they get it from? Yeah. You know, oh, I got it from the wind in the South South uh, San San Francisco Bay. I mean, some of these numbers aren't making sense, and so hence why we're looking at numbers because. If everyone is home, but more people are getting the virus, where the hell are they getting from? You know, the tap water? Are they getting it from the air? Are they getting it from Netflix? Where are they getting it from? And so um, this is the interesting thing that a lot of the narrative that's come through is actually highly false because the data suggests otherwise. I go, I go back to the airlines and trying to get, you know, there's been so many people who've caught flights, full flights, and there's one person has has had the virus, but the people could be as far as my my arm is to me, and that person didn't get it. So yeah, it, yeah. it, it makes no sense. So this is where the numbers and the data are telling them. So we've learned that people lie, the data doesn't, and the data is telling us a consistent story is that the government's response globally has been flawed in so many ways, and actually. Uh, if people were to use their own initiative like they did in Sweden, they'd probably have a better result where you just deal with it like you would deal with, you know, like a, a hurricane. or. A, I know I know. Gordon has one more question, but I'd actually like to see, before we come back to Gordon, if anybody else, Margaret, MW, who is the mysterious MW? Amy, Fred, even you, Adrian, anybody got a question? Right. Coming once, coming twice. No, back to you, Gordon. So with the delay that happens uh, for the two weeks to three weeks delay, we actually know that people are catching the virus somewhere between getting on the plane and getting off of, and ending up at their hotel. Numerous people have actually tested positive a week after. Some people, 14, uh, what was it, 13 days after uh, exposure, they're showing and coming down positive. More data showing that it's the airflow that is actually creating some of this uh, uh, disease, but you don't know because you lock down, but you don't even know the lockdown works for three weeks. So where are you putting so, that in your data? The so three week that, delay. The, the, the method of the, the data, let's come back to where the data is coming from and the hearsay that comes from those research. Because what we found is the research has been all over the place. So that the research that you gave me now will give us one opinion and then someone else will give us another opinion and then someone else will give us another opinion. And there's been so much disjointed um, methods of how that came. Particularly if we come back to the data that says, we don't know where they got it from, untrackable sources, all these things that have appeared. So we can only go from the data of where the cases are, the locations of the data, what they were doing and so forth. So rather than sort of have that conversation about this is what may happen, this what may not, what may happen in the airport or not, or not, we've actually suggested in the recommendation actually is that if people get tested on the day, they may get it in the future, but if they get tested on the day, they've got an app on their phone that would suggest their movements, which is what people have anyway on this stuff anyway. It's called Google it's basically Google, Facebook, and everything else that sits with them. And that would help track where and what the measurements were. And that would be a better and a better way of determining where the spread would go and how it's transmitted more than the reports that say maybe they got it on the plane, maybe they got it from the air conditioning, maybe they got it from here, maybe they got it from there. And I think at the moment the data is not saying to us from all the stuff that we've got globally could be in different locations, but globally, there's one particular source of that data. And that's the key thing, which is not where the untrackable corona victims or corona uh, cases are not clearly mapping a path of a predictive place you would get the virus. So it's like, it's, it, makes uh, me, it makes me think, it makes me think of, um, so, sorry there, Gordon. Uh, it makes me think of, there's another element, and I don't know if you've, you've brought this into your, your approach, but is, there seems to be this very human element of our willingness to give away uh, private information, 
right? Because mm -hmm. what's being considered private is really changing. I mean, it has since, you know, since the jobs came on the iPhone or whatever. But the whole idea of privacy, um, because what you've just said is that um, it's the trackability of it or traceability comes down to people, you know, you know being able to say, basically, I'm open to it. If I want to travel, my passport is not going to just be a flick through piece of thing that I hand in. It's going to be the, you know, me saying, yes, I landed here and I tested, I was okay here and I moved here and I was okay and then something happened here, whatever, right? So it seems, are you, are you looking at the kind of the data privacy awareness abilities? You know, you're going to countries like Germany that are very, very anti it. You know, it's been the flames of being, you know, Trump is doing his job in the States trying to get the flames of, you know, you're giving away my freedom and privacy and all this stuff. So is that, is that element coming into it? Because that seems a really interesting element is the, is the willingness of people to kind of exchange that in exchange for the ability to go back to normal. Gordon raises a great point, and I'm going to use a country, my old country, as the best method of stupidity and known track, trackability. In Australia, they asked about in, in April to download an application called the COVID Safe app. I think between five and six million people downloaded the app. The purpose of the app was to track your movement so that if an outbreak happens, they would find it. Surprise, surprise, one, they haven't turned it on and be they've locked down Melbourne in a curfew state. So the question should be really is, why didn't they do that? No one's asking that question, but you know, if you, if people, I don't know if anyone's got a, maybe Gordon has the US iPhone, but the iPhone and the Android apps, particularly in the new versions, have actually got a COVID tracking part in the settings. They're coming out now. So if you guys want to Google that, you'll find that out. That stuff is coming. That stuff is planned. So that is stuff where you would be able to go, okay, I'm getting on the flight. This is where I'm landing. We're not going to stop the borders. You're going to be, you know, I'm going to be tested at the airport and a rapid response. You haven't got COVID off you go into San Francisco, for instance, but I'm monitoring your location. So if you're near someone at Best Buy who who has got the virus, we can notify you, track you, then test you again. That is the best monitor. Of course, you've got people in Germany, people around the world that just don't, they're the anti-vaxxers, they're people who don't want to, you know, have their privacy broken. The only way not to have privacy broken is to just remove this thing here. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way you get rid of it. It's simple as that. Um, and so for, for you know, I, I think the key thing is that there's some initiatives that the governments have done, and I'll use Australia as an example, that they haven't implemented yet. So the question should be asked, why the bloody hell not? Particularly in Australia where they had this COVID safe app, everyone had it on their phone, they would have avoided lockdown, but surprise, surprise, they didn't turn it on. So eventually a lot of the government heads of state are going to get their heads rolled because the people are going to go, well, you botched up, you botched up, you botched up, you botched up because you had your tools available and didn't do it. This is... They were probably too nervous because they were worried of the backlash of suddenly people realising they had to give away data, right? The privacy. It's that, you know, it's, it's sensitive. You only need 20% right? Downloading an app, downloading an app and having it turned on is slightly different, right? When something goes wrong, you go, oh shit, it's not my fault. Well, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, I think generally the perception that we've seen, and this is more philosophical as opposed to the data, is that people want to do the right thing. Everyone's wearing face masks. Everyone's doing things. But if they have a solution available, people will be willing to take that solution because people want to get their lives back. People miss their family. People miss their friends. And if you know you're sick and you want to visit grandma or grandpa, you're not going to go and see them because you just don't want to see them because you don't want to get them sick. The problem is a lot of that implementation hasn't happened yet. And we are asking in the model and we've in the recommendation, why not? Why can't they? This is a very simple thing to implement. People would willing to do it if they could fly to Thailand to fly to Bali, fly to the US and not have to worry about this stuff anymore. Very nice. Okay, do we have any more questions? Time for one more question. Xavier just joined in. So you only got the end of this, but there'll be a video I'll share later. Um, I have, if there's no other questions, I have one uh, closing question. Uh, which, which conspiracy theory do you believe in? <laughs> uh, or, or maybe, <laughs> because I, I'm hearing so many from my, particularly from French friends, sorry, Xavier, but I, I, I don't know why. I've, I'm getting sent daily, you know, YouTube, philosophical, very, French are very philosophical and they're great at 
when they tell a conspiracy theory, it's wonderful because it sounds so believable. So which one do you, um, well, maybe I should start with not believing. No, believe in. Which one is close? Given the data that you had, which conspiracy theory should we, you know, entertain ourselves with? I'm not going to talk about conspiracy theories because to me that is like, how long is a piece of street? And what I will say is that um, the goalposts have been changing too often yeah. and the data is suggesting that the, the initial concerns people had and the initial approach that CDC, health organisations around the world was not correct. Um, there is a lot of things going around, but I'm looking, I think the only thing that raises my eyebrows quite drastically is the South China Sea and many countries that are very safe have not opened up. So that worries me, like the Philippines have gone back into lockdown, Singapore and Indonesia don't want to have a, 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 a bar in this sort of China or America war. Vietnam is pretty much under lockdown again in Dainan. Thailand's closed down. Taiwan, which, you know, they've been closed down since the bloody 1st of January, which should be hard on the poor Taiwanese. You know, if these guys are clean and calm, why aren't they opening up? So rather than a conspiracy theory, I'm asking the questions, if you are 100% rid of something, why don't you open up? And I think many people aren't asking that question. The data to us suggests, well, you should be able to. The question is, why aren't you? And I think when more people ask that question, why, rather than accept what they're given, then it's irrelevant about conspiracy theories. It's more about what the data tells you and what makes sense from a rational, thought-provoking perspective. You just, if it's clean, open up. But there's nothing to it, you know? It's very simple. You've killed Very nice, very nice. Well, thank you. It's been really good talking. It's been fascinating. I could Pleasure. go on for hours. The data fascinates me. But before we go, there is a, there, now how do I do this? I go this way. Weather oh, report. Yes. You, so you, you've got, you've got you, your, your business is a subscription business, right? So yes, it you're, is. you're saying that you'll offer people a, a discount to subscribe to the data you've got. They're not, not, the co, not the COVID stuff, more around startups, crypto, that whole kind of ecosystem. Well, not two different ecosystems. And there's the code, right? So they go to your website and they enter that code, correct? Yes. WWHKDC. So uh, anyway, thanks, it's been a pleasure, really interesting. And I'm very curious to see uh, what your data is gonna re reveal um, as time goes on. Uh, and I'll, I'll, what I'll do is at the end of this, I'll share. Oh, I see I've got a few comments that have come in here. People are just saying goodbye. All right, very nice, thank you very much. Cheerio. Thank you as all, pleasure's all mine, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>